Hey folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, and um, I've been having such a good time interviewing people who have connections with the Beatles, and with me this time is someone who's had a career all his own. He's been a dear friend of mine for a good 20 years. It's hard for me to believe I've known him for that long. Um, he's a poet and a songwriter. He's best known for his association with the Beach Boys, which we will talk about here uh, in this video. And there is uh, one particular song that we will talk about that was a duet between Paul McCartney and Brian Wilson called A Friend Like You. And this gentleman helped write the song with the lyrics, wonderful lyrics in that song. And that happens to be Stephen Kalinich. Welcome to Ken Michaels Radio. Thank you, Ken. It's been a while since we did an interview. It's about time. And so uh, this is the first time we're doing this on video and it's a great thing. It's Why wonderful. Don't we, yeah. Um, let's just talk about your earliest beginning beginnings and how you uh, first started writing poetry. And did that come first or writing lyrics for songs? How did that all start? When I was about five, I started writing not very good, but simple ones. I know we, because of the time constraints, but I'll give you a small one. At night, I saw the stars above, a sign of peace, of hope and love, the stars that shine above my eyes that make me know God's in the skies. That was the five-year-old effort. Hey, that's that's pretty good for that young an age. But as I as I grew up, Ken, before I became a songwriter per se, or a poet, I, as my search continued for spiritual and things like that, I, instead of looking to the skies for the answers, I started looking inward. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the path that led me to the Beach Boys and later to Paul McCartney. Had you done a lot of poetry prior to working with the Beach Boys? Yes. Okay. But, uh, can I you give an, an example. I came, I came to Brian Wilson, and the first two things I did, there's just too much to go into it. I was uh, working at a gas station, which is kind of interesting, in Westwood, Earl's Courtesy Mobile, making a dollar seventy-five an hour, selling my poems for very little to cars as I would put gas in their car if they wanted to buy one. And Herb Alpert bought one <laughs> one night and a couple other people. And that was how I started selling. I started writing poems about world peace in the local newspaper since I was a, worked in a shop as a delivery boy and at the gas station, I had two jobs. I was married. We were eating waffles every night for $1.99. Uh -huh. And I started writing these poems and the paper published some of them. Um, I wrote America, I Love You that became later on my Brian Wilson album. I did an album with Brian in the 60s mm. called A World of Peace Must Come. A little, right. I started it before I signed with them, but I finished it with Brian and rewrote some of it. Yeah, you can ask me anything specific because I don't know how much to say about anything. Yeah, well, first of all, since you mentioned Herb Albert, did you ever hear back from him? Yeah, he loved it. I later ended up becoming, I was going to type uh, a staff writer for A&M. In fact, he heard the story so much. The last time he saw me, he goes, oh, yeah, I know the story, Stephen. Don't tell me again. <laughs> so uh, and I, I ended up being on his label. That's amazing. Well, As a staff writer after my Beach Boy days. Hmm, okay. I could tell you how I signed with the Beach Boys if you want. I don't know if that's too early. No, no, no. But but before you do that, um, what was it like to work for Herb? Did you spend a lot of time to get to know him at all? Well, I was just at the gas station then. I hadn't signed with him yet. Right. That came later in the story. But when you became a staff writer, did you yeah, have he contact was very, with him a lot? He, yeah, I talked with him a lot, but I dealt more with the publishing wing, which was uh, Chuck K, which the people may know or may not, he was head of the publishing. Lance Freed, who his father was 
Ella Freed, the, the radio guy that was very famous. Okay. That was his son. And Paul Williams was a staff writer there that wrote We've Only Just Begun and sure. things like that. And I became a staff writer. So I would see her and Jerry Moss, but mainly dealt with the publishing wing. Okay. So now tell us how you started to work for the Beach Boys. Well, I started taking my poems and bags around and I was living at the Hollywood Y for $15 a week. And a guy came named Jim Critchlow came to the Y and worked out and we talked and he said, come to my office. And he worked with a guy who created Bullwinkle. That cartoon, right. Roadrunner, right. Meet Me. Jay Ward. And, huh? Jay Ward. Yeah, Jay. Yeah. And Jay, I used to recite to Jay and Jim, and they loved it. And Jim says, I'm friends with Brian Wilson. They started a new record company, Brother Records. Mm -hmm. And he said, you should tell him I told you. So somehow, two guys in the office, Steve Korthoff, was Brian's cousin, Brian Wilson, and Arnie Geller. And they brought me in. They loved my stuff. And then they said, we're going to set up a meeting. And they set up a meeting for me to meet Brian. They took me to the old Aquarius Theater on Sunset, which was, or I think it was called the Aquarius Theater, where the Smother Brothers did their act. And Brian met me. And within a couple of weeks, they signed me. I had a partner then called Mark Buckingham, but not the same one from Fleetwood Mac. And we did a song called Leaves of Grass based on the Walt Whitman poem. Hmm. And they ended up signing me and gave me a weekly salary and money to live on. And they were, uh, this was port 66 or seven. And then I got booked to open for the Maharishi tour with Paul McCartney. That was my first, and the Beatles in 68. Mm -hmm. It started really early. So George Harrison and Paul knew about me, but a week or two before the promoters cancel it. And as you remember, historically, that tour did not do well. And they pulled me out because they were worried with a poet with the rock and roll era in the 60s and psychedelia and all that. Although I later became known as a psychedelic poet. So that was my first encounter. And then in 68, I wrote Little Bird and Be Still, and it became a single on the Friends album, the flip side of uh, the Carl song. Um, Wild Honey? No, um, I'll think of it. I, I, I'm sorry I'm blanking out right now. Okay. Um, Friends? Friends, yeah, flip side of Friends. That was okay. the album. Yeah, okay. you're right. And if it was a single, and that was my first exposure to the Be Beach Boys and the Beatles, first exposure, even though the tour got canceled, they were already aware of me. Okay. And Al said when he did go to England, he told George and Paul about me. Hmm. So prior to recording those two songs, um, Little Bird and... Um, be still. Be still. You know, were they were they looking at your lyrics? Yes. In your poetry. In fact, when I uh, it got to such a point where the manager Nick Grillo, the business manager, and Carl and Dennis and Brian agreed, when there was a new lyricist trying to get in the company, I would be the one to screen them and say, "Is this guy any good or not?" They would send me all the lyrics from everyone. Hmm. So I said, "This is not worth pursuing." It's a responsibility. I never talked about that part because that was short lived, only one year. And how did they single out those two songs or those two lyrics? Well, Dennis and I started writing and those were the first two we did. Uh, Little Bird, I was sitting at his piano and I looked up in the tree and I saw Little Bird and the, the song almost was given to me. Little Bird up in a tree looked down and sang just how it happened. I really saw the bird. A lot of my Beach Boy songs happen that way. And I, all the story, he told me a story about how it began. So, and the Trout in the Shining Brook gave a warm and loving look and told me not to worry. 
So in those first two lines in my pop experience, every song I ever write or any answer to any question in the universe was in those first four lines for me. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. So by coming like a Zen almost, by an immediate experience of nature. So I brought this kind of consciousness and also in my poems to the Beach Boys. Mm. Now, how do you compare writing with Dennis and Brian? Is it a similar experience or? or Two different like? experiences, but in the case of them, 98% of the time, I wrote the words first. They don't do that with everyone. Mm -hmm. I didn't write to tracks like I wrote the words and then they wrote the melody inspired by my words, except with the McCartney record, a friend like you, Brian, <laughs> wrote the melody first. That's why it may have a little di different texture or tone than the other ones. So most of my Beach Boy experience was I would initiate the words first. Mm. How many songs would you say in total you've written with the brothers? With all of them? Yeah. I'd say... An estimate. I'd say... 50 to 100 and about 20 some or more were recorded. Maybe That's pretty even good. more, yeah. Uh, and luckily, some of them got notoriety and some of them later got notoriety. Mm. Little Bird, Be Still, Rainbows on Pacific Ocean Blue, A Time to Live in Dreams later on Hawthorne, the McCartney record, Many years later, that was many years later. That was in already 2000s. That wasn't that long ago. And there was always a constant flow, but I broke my contract. They didn't get rid of me because I was not happy the way they were. They were a little weird with the money, the management, not them. Mm. So I broke my contract. Okay. You can ask me anything specifically to get to what you want if you wanted the meat of something. No, but you know, um, it's a Beatles show, and uh, I always wanted. In fact, this is relevant if it's okay with you. When I was working in the cellars in the gas station time, I took another job scraping the asbestos off the pipes. <laughs> and you know, it's a dangerous job. You had to wear a mask like now, but for a different reason. So I always had the dream that I would write with Paul McCartney. Now it's the 60s. Hmm. So I wrote this little song. I never sent it. I wrote the music too. You'll laugh. Dear Paul McCartney, enclosed are a few poems of mine. Please read them through. And if you like them, drop me a line. I write them in the morning when the world is still asleep. I write them in the evening in the cellars that I sweep. Dear Paul McCartney. And years later, Paul McCartney ends up doing one of my songs 30 or 40 years later. I put that out to the universe. I never sent it to him. I never told him this one, unless mm -hmm. someone else did. And, but don't, isn't that, you find that fascinating? Oh yeah, you told me this story many years ago. I so it, it proves that it's kismet, <laughs> that eventually, <laughs> you know, you'd end up working with him in some capacity. And it's funny, all the people that I projected I have worked with, Amazing. Very, very interesting. Yeah, uh, I, there, I think there is some kind of grace to it. I can't explain it, but I don't know what you think. And I think John Lennon tuned into that and the, later George, but uh, George had that unity of oneness within you and without you. Mm -hmm. I, I was drawn to a lot of his lyrics, similar paths, except yeah. I did not believe, I, I followed a few, I didn't believe in following people. I believed in following the grace that God was directly accessible to me. I didn't have to go through a church or through a doctrine eventually. And that's my philosophy. I don't put down any of these people, but I want direct access to the source of grace. I don't want to go through a person. I'm not putting down or disrespecting. Mm. And I think that that's what John uh and that they came to and George came to eventually, even though he did follow certain things. I think ultimately we knew what we are looking for. Everything is inside the possibility, not of our limited self, but the grace that we, if we're in the Grand Canyon, instead of the Grand Canyon being out there and us being a tiny speck, we are 
but echo a part of the Grand Canyon. That's right. kind of what I would say the awesomeness of Grace is. Yeah. Makes sense? And within you, without you, really are lyrics that say exactly what you just said. Yes, and I was saying that a different way, but but yes, and and uh, he based it on Hinduism and Zen studies, but it's true in all, I didn't base it on that. Even the Jewish background, I had a Jewish background, a Christian background, a Catholic background. I tried all the religions. We don't have time to go into all that. Mm. So they all fit into eventually this philosophy, which now in the world is open to a divine grace or a not necessarily a man or a woman like some religion, but a grace that we all spring from, we all will go back to that is the source of all and beyond what we understand as a limited human. When the Beatles were doing songs like Within You Without You, the spiritual stuff, especially what George was doing, and I know you've also told me that Let It Be is a very important song for you, that you really connect with that. How were you at that time? You, you must have been really absorbing what the Beatles were doing. Well, I was level. absorbing, but I was already there, I would say, before they put that stuff out. Because mm. if you listen to Little Bird, uh, it's the same think about it little bird up in a tree gave me that message little bird up in a tree looked down and sang a song of how it began and that's what they're talking about how it began divine love the trout gave me a a, a message and they told me not to worry don't worry about your life the grace if you turn to it if you turn to the meditation to the peace the inner harmony that's what will work your life out ultimately that's their message too I was there before Maharishi. I'm not saying I created it before, but I discovered it. But I found out for thousands of years, people have been knowing this. But until you make it individually your own reality and live it, to say I love you, but not to love you, to experience the love you. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's learning to live my lyrics too and try and just live them, not thinking I'm great because I write them because we, we all it's like the water when you turn the faucet on we all have access to that water some of us turn it on more I do believe some have more of a gift I don't know if you do but my belief is it's not that everyone is equal in that but you can get your own water for what your own life is so Does before the make- Beatles before the Beatles were going to India with the Maharishi and all and you said you were already into studying that kind of thing before all of it, did the Beach Boys learn from you? I would say, ask Dennis, or well, you can't ask Dennis, but Brian, Al Jardine said they did learn from me. I don't want to say that, but I didn't know. For me, it was not anything to learn. It was a given. These things that I discovered when I was younger, it's like a given, like, you know, in, in geometry of givens, Mm -hmm. the theorems and you know something's given a equals b like that for me it was like i come from somewhere that is beyond what i conceive of and that's within you without you to me all those lyrics and all music comes from that source through individual channels which might be us might be you why did you get interested in the beatles so Instead of giving myself all the credit, I give some credit to the individual efforts, but it's like it happened in me. It was a gift. Life is a gift. And through this gift of life, some lyrics came. Some people maybe don't like my lyrics or think they're too square. But for me, the reason they're valuable, and that's where the Beatles come in and the Beach Boys, when you can apply a lyric, good vibrations, let it be. When you're troubled, when your heart is breaking and you don't know what to do and you're hitting your head against the wall, I'm not saying alert, let it be, let it be. It's Mm -hmm. like turn things over to grace. It's another way of saying it, let it be. Uh, And Hey Jude's another one. Uh, But I think McCartney is just as much spiritual with that song 
as within you and without you and imagine. Let it be is on the level with those songs for me. It mm -hmm. goes to the same, I don't know if you agree with me, Ken, but it goes to the same message. And I would say the thing we love about music is the sharing. We can all share that. Mm -hmm. Pure music comes from love and expression and maybe trying to right the wrongs. And it goes as a gift to us. We claim ownership, but the music was there before we were born and will be there after. And we leave our music, but we don't leave ourselves that we know of yet, unless we find that out. Mm -hmm. Well, you definitely need songs like Let It Be in your life to get you through troubled times. Yeah, and, and, and uh, like, yeah. There's other songs like that you would think of like Bridge Over Troubled Water that have oh, these yeah. kind of, and you know, there's a lot of those. And wouldn't you say there's parallels in a lot of them? Absolutely. I'm it's curious. Just, I'm curious to know why you said you, you always felt that you would write with McCartney or work with McCartney instead of George. I mean, you just explained, yes, let it be. Hey Jude, there's a similarity there, but given George, his immediate connection to spirituality, how he got into it so much more than the others early on, I would have thought maybe you would have felt more of a connection with George. I felt as much, but here's the thing. I gave George a handwritten copy uh, of If You Knew, my book before it was published, before I even said this other thing to you. I never told you that. I was hitchhiking. And one of Nat, Nat King Cole's daughters, not Natalie, but her sister, one of them, I gave her a handwritten copy and George had it. So when he met me at Poponi's in different places with Mawson, he knew of the book. And that was before that he released the Sgt. Pepper album, I believe, mm. with, with me without you. So I was already on that path. And I, I did, I, I just thought we would write, but it, somehow McCartney was the one that came. But I did have that affinity with George, John, and Paul. A lot mm. of people think Paul was, didn't have that, but I see it in him. I'm not saying he was, con now they were both more consciously attuned to it. And I thought John was very into it by even as far out lyrics, there was a certain freedom of expression, a be still quality about it. Hmm. Okay. That's, that's my view. Mm -hmm. So I did, on, on second thought, I did think of that, but somehow I didn't know that I would write with Paul and Brian, though. That was the surprise part. So the grace of the universe put me, and, and also contrary to what everyone says, Brian said, well, I wrote that for Paul. I wrote the song with Brian, and then we got Paul. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I'd love to take credit. You've, you've gone through this in interviews with me before, but I wrote that song and then we got Paul to do it. That's how it came about. Mm -hmm. Brian said that they were rehearsing it and they wanted Paul to do it live and I heard he didn't want to do it. I don't know the real story. I think Mark Lynette has tapes of him calling about the song. So you wrote the lyrics first you gave yes. it to Brian? No, no, not on a friend like you. Brian gave me a melody on a friend like you. That's remember I told you, that's the only one. So when I went, I left Brian's house, uh, the opening part where it says, when I look back at my life, when I, you know, through the years, one thing rings out loud and clear, a friend like you. And then it goes in the song. I wrote all that in the car. And then I put it to note to note, a friend like you. You stand beside me and then I, you have courage, you risk it all. Mm -hmm. Pick me up and every, each, each syllable has a, that's how the universe gave it to me. Now, some people thought that was square, but the thing is, it wasn't about Paul. I love Paul. It was about friendship. In other words, if you had a friend that was that, dead, like, I love you, we've mm -hmm. become friends. I could have written that song to you or Joanne or, you know what I'm saying? But, but it fit in that thing. But when Brian said, I said, you can say we dedicated to him, but I didn't write it for him. Right. That, that would be, it would be very beautiful to say, and it would look like it, 
but it was more like we fell into that the universe was bringing us there. Yeah. So it was only after you wrote those words and gave it to Brian that he thought of Paul for the song. Well, well I don't know if he thought of Paul first. We toyed around with it for a while and then it ended up they were going to do duets and Paul, they got Paul. Mm hmm. Were they in the studio? Although together? I did. After I did it, I thought it would be good for Paul. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. I think I might have said something to Melinda. I don't remember the exact, but yes, I did think of that. And I remember that when Al Jardine told me he talked to George about me when they were going to, I was booked to open for the Maharishi, right? You know right. about that. Mm -hmm. I was booked for that tour, which also is in that thought, right? Get a mantra, do it. But if you don't use a mantra and you just say to yourself, be still, just make that your mantra. Within you, without you, make that your mantra. Mm -hmm. Let it be, let that be your mantra. Little bird up in a tree, look down and sing a song. Let that make whatever you want to re or say, before Abraham was, I am. Whatever you might say that will bring your consciousness to the recognition that you sit in a deeper bed of a self that you are a part of and that goes very deep to the beginning of time, to the end of time. And even when you leave and how you disperse, we are part of that energy. Right. A friend, like you, a friend like you is very much like a mantra and how it's repeated those words think, over and over I again. I think it is, to me, it's on the level with Little Bird, it'd be still, uh, and I think with with some of the Beatles songs in the sense, if you could understand a friend like you could be God, it could be the universe. It doesn't mean Brian and Paul alone. That might yeah. open it up for the people that say it's so corny and square. It's not because if you have a friend, if the universe is your friend, if you find that space of grace within you and without you, it, you see how it all ties in for me. Mm -hmm. And Go ahead. Yeah, did did Paul record that in the studio with Brian at the same time or were his vocals yes, flowing yes. in? Yes, at Mark's house. No, he came over. He Mark went Lynette. to Mark. Yeah, he, he went to the house and I think they did some in the studio at Capitol. And he came over. I did not go to that session. Uh, I went to other sessions, but I didn't go to that one. And I did another song on that album, but Paul didn't do it. Hmm. Did you ever meet Paul? Yeah, but I didn't have a real deep conversation. And I think it was before I wrote that song for him. But he, but I have had exchanges with him, which we'll talk about later. Yeah. But I didn't hang out with him like I did with Nielsen or with George or even Ringo I met, you know, like at parties and stuff. Mm -hmm. and Paul wasn't at those. He went to maybe one that we were at, but it was not heavy. And he wasn't at Nielsen's when I went with Van Dyke and Brian and oh, Dr. John, all those guys, John Hanford. Right. You want to talk about Harry and your relationship with him? Well, I'd like to, if it's okay with you, because it is connected. He was very close with Paul. Mm. And sure, go ahead. Yeah. One night, Brian says to me, uh, I told my friend Harry about you and there's a party tonight, we're going to RCA and I want you to go and they all know about you. And I hadn't met anybody yet, really, basically. Uh, Lennon was not in town, but so I picked Brian up. I had a Mercedes sunroof then. <laughs> and so we, we went to first RCA and we're hanging around, Ringo's there and everyone were having a blast. John Hanford, musicians that you know, um, just, it was fantastic, fun. And then we got, we went to go on the bus and we, we, I sat next to Ringo and Brian was there. And before the bus started, Brian goes, I don't wanna ride on the bus. Can we follow them in your car, Stevie? So we got off the bus after seeing Harry and everyone. Mm -hmm. And we followed him in my Mercedes and Brian was sticking his head out of the roof on the way to 94th Air Force Squadron. And we rode all the way there and Brian was waving it. You know, it was, a, it was in really good shape, good form. And then we ended up in 94th Air Force Squadron and the party was there. And there was Ringo and Dr. John and 
and, and Brian sat me right next to Harry. And they introduced me to everyone. Harry took me around everybody. And it reminds me of another story, which I know you got limited time with. <laughs> Mel Brooks once when he first met me at a bar when Carl Reiner's wife was singing. And he took me around to everyone in the bar and saw how great a songwriter I am. And I said, Mel, you've never heard any of my songs. He goes, they don't know that. <laughs> So like, it reminds me of the night, like Harry was taking me to everyone and he never heard one thing I did. So mm. like, he was such a nice guy and he took me under his wing because he knew I didn't know anyone. That's the first night I met Van Dyke really. Okay, what, do you, what year would you say this was, do you know? It was between 69 and 70 or 70. What year did that record come out that they did at RCA that time? Which remember? one of, uh, you know, you can go back to Pandemonium Shadow Show. Are you talking about that? Or are you talking about I later I could, on? I have to, I have to look up that 94th Squadron. It'll probably tell in the internet what party that was, what record. Uh, Dr. John was there. I think he played on it too. I'll find out for you. Is that all right to delay that answer? That's, that's all right. Yeah. Okay. But, but how close were you with Harry through the years or were there just a few? I kept, no, no, I kept up with him, but I wasn't hanging out with him all the time, but I became friends and he respected me and he was really kind to me. Mm -hmm. And then it came to where I met his son later and I became really close with his son. Sad. Right, right. We'll talk about him in just in a few moments, but did he become aware of your, of your lyrics and your poetry? He became aware of some of it and so did Danny Hutton. Remember he was friends with them. Do you vaguely remember about that? Three Dog Night right. and Harry were really close. So Brian took me one Thanksgiving to, uh, to Danny's house. It was wild. I, the times may be up. And he had me recite some poems for, uh, for the guys from Three Dog Night, uh, for Danny, mm -hmm. and they loved it. So Brian would get me at a party and have me in the 60s even recite in a room and sometime they'd be there, Al Jardine, or one of these guys from one of the groups, John Kay, Stepan. Right. I did a song with him, didn't get released, but Brian and I did it. And uh, it's called um, Action, Reaction, Satisfaction, something like that. So um, that you could ask me more direct. I'm, I'm maybe not be answering as directly. That's as you. okay. It's just you, you have so many connections with so many people. I'd love to get I know. Them. That's why. And I know you've got limited time. That's why I'm trying to make it brief. Uh, um, I could go in each one for 20 minutes. You could talk a bit about Zach, who was Harry's first child. Zach, and, I got to know through the Nielsen tributes. What they used to let me do, Todd, who ran the place, um, would let me do a poem and they would all pick a song of Harry's and do it. Todd Lawrence is his name, mm -hmm. wonderful guy. And um, he, he did it and, and Harry was always represented. All his songs, people picked out different songs. We had all kinds of people. The guy that played SpongeBob was there and you'd get stars and you get other people that would do a, t a Harry song. But what I did is, since I was not the greatest singer, a couple of times I did Salmon Falls as a spoken and a few of Harry's things. But also I would do one of my own of something that Harry liked of mine that I remembered, like the magic hand. And I would mm -hmm. say, this is one that Harry used to like. And Zach came and then he wrote that song. He was a bigger man than me. And we became friends and he always come up to me and said, I really like your poetry. We started talking. And then when I went into the studio later, I'm not giving you times, but he played drums and everything like that. Oh, he, he, I actually got to interview Zach really because of my friendship with you. And that also led to my interviewing his brother Kifo, another one of, of Harry's sons. I know Kifo a little, but not as well as Zach. Yeah, and Zach was so sweet to me and just so honest. And he was such a wonderful guy. Yeah, he just passed away for people yes. that aren't aware of that. Yeah, he, he was, was only 50 a, years old. He was one of the sweetest men. And I perhaps I learned more from him than anyone I know or any song. The way he embraced 
leaving this earth mm. or however you call it, I have never, I found so much wisdom in him, such a beautiful spirit, such a good natured soul. I learned as much from him as anyone in music. I'm just being, that's my statement. Mm. And, no, he, he came across as so down to earth, just yes, a regular he guy. So, and He was so down to earth. Yeah. He loved dogs. <laughs> oh, he, <laughs> and, loved, uh, he loved dogs. And uh, he's a big Star Wars fan too, right? Yeah. And, and I went out to his house even when he was ill with Nick Kuzman and his mother, Christina. Uh -huh. And uh, he just became a part. Everyone just loved him. And his, his wife, Dawn, was wonderful. You never hear much about the wife, but she was there to support him mm. in a beautiful way. Amazing woman. Yeah, he actually, I, he, he had colon cancer for everyone uh, wondering. And he used to, to call, do these. Yeah, call awareness. Yeah, he used to do these can, cancerokies, <laughs> these yeah. videos where he sang along to records. And I tell you, he had a really good singing voice. And everybody knew, started to know about Zach. And he would tell everything. Hmm. And he played the drums too very yeah. well you played them to the record so you yes. saw and a lot of potential want, there yeah 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 if, if you want to ask about anything that you know what we talked about you can but you don't have to no that's that's fine anything you want to share about zach with my audience is fine well i'd like to say that i reached out privately to paul mccartney and he wrote to Zach and Zach shared on Facebook or something, which I didn't do that, shared it and it gave Zach a big, big lift. Mm. So, and I, re, I also, I followed through with um, Stuart Bell, who you turned me on to really originally. Okay. Because I wanted to see the follow through and then that's how he got interested in and wrote to Zach to help him and just comfort him. And it gave Zach love that he told everybody. I think he even put it on Facebook. He did. People, yeah, and people, I shared it. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, good. I, uh, uh, I, and, and he said that Paul McCartney mentioned my name and all that, but I didn't do it for that reason, obviously, but I was very touched. I, it showed me a different, how nice a guy, Paul, to take time for that. And he was really good friends with Harry. Mm. Did you see the letter? I did see the letter. I, I read it, sure. Yeah, and, and uh, it was very touching. And of course, I told him when Zach passed. But on Beatles' note, Paul McCartney is a really good guy. And other things, when I've written him private things, he's responded for people that needed something from him or letters or like that, but we won't talk about specifics, but he's there in a way that is very down to earth. He's like just a regular guy that happened to be a greatest songwriter, one of the greatest ever and loves people. But I'm very impressed with that quality of Paul. And I imagine you are too. And yeah. I don't think everybody knows that. Yeah, I, I remember the letter so well, and it was just words of encouragement for Zach and also saying how much, um, how much he loved his dad. Yeah. So it was just very nice of him to do that at that time, but um, he, he and, will be missed. definitely. Zach, Zach said that the one time the father took him to George Harrison's house when yep. they were in England, you, you know, do, did Zach tell you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's not, but, but Zach loved music and he was, had a funny, he could tell jokes. He was a real interesting guy. And he was kind of nerdy in some ways. I mean that in a positive. He knew all about the games. A very sweet, I think, an advanced soul. I think we all learned from him. Yeah, sure. OK, uh, we'll talk about the Beatles a little bit later on. But I want to touch upon some of the people that you've worked with. There's so many of them. Bring and unfortunately. Up the uh, unfortunately, a lot of them have passed away and in recent years, but I know that you were friends with Mary Wilson and um, she recorded a song that you wrote the lyrics for. And it's 
been re released or it's just being released now? It's Can you talk re-released about this on Universal. Kenny Hirsch was the melody writer and Gus Dudgeon, who was Elton John's producer and many others, but he was very known. He produced it and they loved the song and they gave me a mention in the re-release because uh, I did a public service announcement where we played that song for mm. the homeless and for the, the virus. And I introduced that song and told that was going for that cause. And Mary did a little video clip, which they allowed to put on the show that from Chris uh, Allen's video that he, she went to his house. I didn't ask her to that. I said, could you interview him? And she flew to his house. He, she flew, he, he flew to her house and she let him in and he interviewed her. She is another one of the sweetest people that would always help people, always do causes, always mm. do great things. You could ask me anything about her. So yeah, it's re-released now. And they said they wanted more Hirsch Kalinich songs, but now she's gone. Uh, right. It's a big ballad. For a while, I questioned whether those ballads were too sappy, you know, you dance my heart. But the thing is, with the world as harsh as it is, there is a place for those romantic ballads. Sh sure, it's idealistic. Sure, who, who has a love like that? But it's like Cinderella. We need those stories, mm. I think. Do you? I think so. I'm a big yeah. fan of love songs. And that's the words yeah. in a world of Cinderella's where the slipper seldom fits. You came and softly touched me with your light. Mm. You dried up all my tears, put a smile upon my heart. You gave my life a beauty that will never part. You dance my heart around the stars each day. You carry me so far beyond what any earthly dream can be. You mm. dance my heart. So I think there is a place for these songs. And I, for a while, I thought it was not like square to write so sappy, but I, I now like it as I've gotten to be out of my teens recently, <laughs> joke. And uh, I, I think there's a place for that kind of sweetness in the world. Hey, I like sap. Yeah. And I, I make no excuses for it. I'm proud of my musical taste. I love, well, I silly love songs. I was, that's what I was drawn to you, I think, when I first met you. Huh. So when exactly was this first recorded? You Dance My Heart Around the Stars, that song with Mary Wilson? In the, oh God, I think in the 70s. I have to look it up. Mm. I think it's in the 70s. Maybe Kenny Hirsch, my partner, who is quite a good songwriter, as you know. Mm -hmm. Two Less Lonely People in the World, he wrote. I've Never Been to Me with Ron Miller. Just a lot of great songs for a lot of big artists. Ah, the uh, Charlene we, hit. That was a big Yeah, yeah. Thing. And yeah. Free, free to Pain. Uh, he's the... Kenny's amazing. And, and uh, before Mary passed, I did a song with her where she helped me with the lyrics and Kenny put a melody someone else did and maybe we'll get a demo of it and give it to our state and see if they want to. Mm -hmm. How come it took that long for it to be reissued? You know what? I don't know. You'd have to ask Universal. Uh -huh. But Universal okay. was very sweet with me. And I think Mary was a graceful woman. Mm. I know Diana got most of the credit and Diana's great, but Mary, well, you could tell by that song, that voice wasn't used in the Supremes, that particular style. She had a good voice. She had her own feelings. No doubt about it. When she did that recording. Her voice was tip top. It's kind of tough when, you know, Diana Ross is singing lead on all those early hits and you've got a formula there and you don't want to do anything to mess with that. So yeah, but, but you I, never see Diana Ross sing something like you dance my heart on stars. I think Mary did a better job than anyone could have done on that or as, as good as anyone. Yeah. And I did see, um, you know, what she was saying shortly before her passing, she had a lot of plans, immediate plans for things to do. And uh, what a, she was what ambassador a, of goodwill for the United States. She'd go around and encourage other countries and people. She was a wonderful, good person. I'm still in touch with her family and her daughter. And I try and her manager, I try to stay in touch. They're mm. a good bunch of people. Of all my Motown and Joe experience, I have a really good memory and she's one of the best. Okay. Um, another good friend of yours was P.F. Sloan. 
Oh God. How did you come to work with him? Believe it or not, Daniel Rutherford, who's married to Marilyn Wilson, Brian's first wife. I did meet him years ago, but nothing ever, we never clicked. And he said, you should meet PF. And so one party for Marilyn, he was there. They introduced me the next day. I sent him a lyric, Soul of a Woman. That song's on that Sailover album that John Tiffin produced. And uh, that was the first night I met him. Three days later, he had the melody, The Soul of a Woman. He said, I've had those three chords in my mind for 10 years. And uh, he said, they were just waiting for your lyric. He hardly changed a word, uh, although that didn't happen on every song. He was one of the best songwriters underrated. I put him on a level, you may not, but I put him on a level, McCartney, Lennon, Brian, anyone, but he had, he could write any genre, kick that little foot, Sally Ann, where were you when I needed you, secret agent man, uh, oh my God, so many, I can't even think of them all. And he was a great, and we went to India together with John Tibbon too. And we had wrote quite a few songs together. We would go to movies together, go to dinner, go to traveling together. We went to Palm Springs to stay with Marilyn at their house in Palm Springs with Daniel and her. And so I owe Daniel that. And also my album with World of Peace Must Come that came out on vinyl in 2014, 50 years later almost. Daniel is responsible for that. But as I tell him, if you didn't marry Marilyn, you got to give her some credit. I never would have met you. He, but he, did, he won't have it. He said, I'm the one that introduced you. Marilyn said, let him have it. He's a great guy, though. You know, I remember when, when his book came out, his autobiography, P.F. Sloan's book. And um, I read the whole thing, and I was kind of getting ready to interview him. This is through you, actually. You were going to help me get an interview with him. Yeah, he would have done it. Yeah, and then he passed away, unfortunately. But um, you just mentioned all these different genres of music that he could write in. And the one thing that I took from reading his book was that he seemed to be extremely frustrated because he wasn't taken that seriously as a songwriter. Because on the one hand, he'd write something like Eve of Destruction, and then he'd write, you know, a must to avoid, <laughs> you know, for Herman's Hermits or something like that's that. A or Secret song, Agent. Yeah, yeah. I, I know, but on the one hand, it's it's almost like people in the industry didn't know how to classify him. What was his gift, identity? He was gifted in so many areas. He didn't focus on one. But later, if you hear his Beethoven record, which I don't know if you've heard it yet. I did, actually. Yeah, or yeah. I can get you one. It's brilliant, but it's a different... I took, I took uh, Joe Wizard over there and Bones Howe. They liked it, but they didn't know what to do. You know, that kind of producer was very good. They didn't know exactly how to, to get it marketed. Hmm. Okay. And that's important to some people in the music business. Yes, they make a living that way. Yeah, I was listening to that last album of his just to get ready to interview him because we were going to talk about that and the book. But um, wow. Beethoven. Did, you, did you sense this frustration? in P.F. Sloan and how he was, you know, yeah, hard yes, to but, identify in the business? Yes, but later when he did the Beethoven, he got a clarity of what he wanted to do more. So the last years he was clear on Beethoven and getting that message. Because if you listen to the lyrics and one of the songs, one hand holds the candle, the other holds the knife. So that's what he, that shows, just like John Lennon's, that's a very intense, deep lyric. One hand holds the candle, the other holds the knife. Mm. I mean, and between these notes I'm playing. Da -da -da, you know, Beethoven, Beethoven. He, it's just, he puts his soul into it because he was like a frustrated, and Beethoven was frustrated. A great composer that can't hear, mm. they can't see. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. He was also a great guitar player, P.F. Yeah, he was great. And he was a great performer. Mm -hmm. He could have, he, he was very good. If you saw him live, he was very good. Even Brian used to say. And I don't think they ever gave him a chance as a performer to really be. But if you've seen him at concerts, you'll see he was really good. You yeah. saw him live before, right? No, I never mm -hmm. did get to see him live. I'll send you Sorry something. To say. I'll send you something. Okay. Um, yeah, he was an amazing 
performer. You could ask me anything specific about him. He also was a friend that cared about me. He would call me on things I couldn't get away with my cute personality occasionally. <laughs> he wouldn't let me slide. He called me, no, you can't do that, Stephen. Mm. He was tough in that way, tougher than anyone I worked with probably. But you got a better song. Mm. I would have loved to have seen the two of you work together. Oh my God. Just like a lot of these collaborations that you've done. John Tibbon. Ooh. He's fantastic. John Tibbon is one of the most prolific, fantastic, but he's also a great producer. He produced this new Steve Cropper record that's number one on the blues charts now. And they got a singer. Um, oh my God, my mind is blank. They'll kill me. Um, <laughs> he got a singer that I love. I'm, I apologize. That's all right. That's I'm okay. blanking out on it. I hope you can look it up. And uh, sorry. That's okay. It is out there. It's such a wonderful record. Well, he's known for working with R&B artists from the past, yeah, yeah. you know, Wilson Pickett. And, and John Tip, Tiven opened the door to working with Brian May. Mm -hmm. And when we went to England with P.F. Sloan and India, um, uh, I, I'm not gonna answer that, but it's on, it's ringing. So sorry about that. I thought That's I okay. shut, my, shut my phone off. Does that bother you? I don't know how to shut it off. Uh, eventually it'll probably stop. <laughs> Press something on the side, I guess it stopped. Okay. Um, so, well, ask me again. I got sidetracked there. Sorry. Yeah, just talking about John Tivin and and the new album, the Steve Keith Proper Reed one. from Procol Harum. I got to work with him and Brian May, a couple right. songs through John, and then Frank Black, Black Francis from the Pixies. I did a duet with him. Mm. And then Ellis Hooks, you probably, these are very good artists, maybe not as well known, wonderful artists. Uh, Betty LeVette. Sure. Did a song with us. Hmm. That's uh, heavy duty uh, personnel right there, all those people. Yeah. And it was just, it's been a great experience. I'm probably missing out on some collaborators. Dennis Wilson, David Marks. Did I talk about David Marks from Not the Beach yet. Coast? Not Incredible yet. performer. Yesterday, he and his daughter came over to see me. We went to the Santa Monica Pier and got some food and walked to the end of the pier. It was beautiful sailboats out there. But he's an underrated, incredible guitar player, as you know, and was with the first five albums. But he still can play, and he's a good writer. We've done some songs together like... Uh, I fall into the grace. Johnny went down to the river with a shotgun in his hand, like almost swamp music, like mm. nah, 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 you know, like almost hillbilly music. And we we've had a blast. And I I've, I've seen him all around the world when I lived in New York. I would go visit him. He's just a great talent. And as you've seen him play, on, he was on the 50th anniversary, as you know. Mm -hmm. Just a wonderful guy and a fun guy, underrated, but he can really play the guitar. Yeah, I've seen Beach and when, Boys tours and, and I've Al seen Brian Jardine, a lot. Yeah. And Al Jardine, I opened for him at the Big Sur thing with Dewey Bunnell of America and Billy Henchy. I was the opening poet, both at the Hearst Castle and at the Henry Miller, which is a very amazing experience. Mm. So any, I know you want to talk too about Beatles and stuff. So I don't want to overdo it with all the other stuff. There's so much more but we can only touch so much. Yeah. Well, since you just mentioned reading your poetry to music, I know that um, you, you struck up a friendship recently with Lawrence Juber, who is such an amazing guitarist. And you performed together on stage with some of your, your poetry, right? We, we've done three or four shows together in big audiences, huge to, for a charity. And I would take one of my poems on the home and he would, improvise a melody behind it mm. and we did two or three big ones but then we even did a house party at someone's house in uptown or way out in the valley toward the raceway uh oh high race track and um same venue that peter noon would play there and and we did it and 
and on the venue with Lawrence and I were was um, John York of the Birds, and the drummer, other the, one of the guys from Wings that you know, and um, another another member of Wings. Yeah. Oh, probably Denny Sywell. No, it was another name you would know. And I'm just right now. I'm tonight. I'm not sharp on the names. Oh, Steve Holly. Steve Holly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great guy. Mm. And so. I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of these guys and I've worked, I'm trying to think anybody else you can think of that, that you like, that you know. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk about this particular CD, which actually highlights, you know, a lot of the people that you've written with who perform your songs, California Feeling, which is a song that you, that you wrote with Brian. You want to yes. just talk about that song in particular? Yes. Um, I went surfing with Brian Moss many years ago at San Onofre. And uh, I was not a good surfer. I tried it a few times and I scraped the board and the mother told me and his sister that it was anyone else but me, he might've killed him. But since it was me, he let me off the hook. So I didn't put that part in the song. So that's where that song was born, my surfers. I was walking down the beach in San Onofre. That's where we surfed the first time. Mm. So that was me coming to California and tasting the oranges because I used to buy them in the store in New York and the grapefruit and going down the coast and the loveliness and the open feeling of you can do anything, but you end right. up being a bus boy. <laughs> you know, all those things. So I think it's still, and finally it's gotten on more records, but I think one day as Al told me and other people, Al did a version to Al Jardine. Mm. The Honeys did a version, Brian's first wife, Marilyn, mm. Ginger, and Diane. Um, I think California Feeling. And then Alec Baldwin did a spoken version of part of it. I did a spoken version too, different song, but the same elements. I was walking down the beach. It was such a beautiful day. The wind was blowing through my hair. That whole feeling of going to the West, a new frontier the open waters, the sky, some kind of freedom, a land where dreams might come true. Right. And often they don't, and people end up homeless in the gutter. I mean, there's quite a dichotomy. So California feeling is powerful. And I love that song. You could ask me a specific question about it. No, I love it too. It's and just Brian's cool. melody, I think that melody is amazing. Mm -hmm. And Brian's original version himself, it's just fantastic. Yeah. The one well, that no one hears, the one that was done at his, in the studio with no one else there. Later on, they put different versions that are pretty good, but nothing tops Brian's. Okay. Um, but this particular compilation, I was looking online and I saw it was reissued just recently. Yeah, they reissued it. Al Gomes helped with that, put that package together. But it was a lot of people, but Al Gomes mm -hmm. did it and Mark Lynette and I guess Alan Boyd all had something with, but people seem to forget that Carol M Miss Music put it out and she's the one that made it possible originally to do it. She should be recognized. Yeah, Carol. well, this is the one that has the Honeys version. Yeah. But it's a lot of great people on there and John Tivins on it. Carl Wilson's on it. Oh, Carl. Carrie, Carrie and Wendy. Carney and Wendy. That's what I said, yeah. Carney and Wendy. Oh. Yeah, they are fantastic. Mm. And Proben, I don't know if he's on that from Brian's band, and it's just wonderful. Yeah, highly recommend this. Okay. You get a chance to. And then I also have the CD with you and John Tivin of Shortcuts to Infinity. Oh, that is an amazing record. And that's got the Brian May song on it, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an amazing record. And we've got some great artists, and it's it's a different style. It's almost like wouldn't you say like almost like a Rolling Stones record? Somewhat, yeah, <laughs> I would say so. Yeah. yeah, you've worked with so many great people. Is it always easy for you to come up with lyrics? Or no, not always, but uh, now I have to think twice, you know, to try and do something maybe new or a different viewpoint. Mm -hmm. If yeah. I can, 
But there's only so many themes and ideas if you think about it, it's saying it in different ways. I'm sad, I'm lonely, I love you. Things are awful, we gotta change them. I'll never get over it, the blues, but I might get over it. I have mm -hmm. hope, I don't have hope. There's certain themes that, right? I could, you could give me categories. Yeah. Well, uh, usually when you come up with a set of lyrics, do you automatically think, oh, this is for John Tiven or someone no, else? Is it no, because each person I would send it to will have a different melody. Now, sometimes I might have seen it if I wrote the melody, although my melodies aren't too much the same. If I write a melody, I might see it differently, but I, I'm, I try and let it go the way they do it. Sometimes if I really gut level don't like it, I've written so many thousands of songs, maybe I should be more critical, but life is so fast, short, that I, unless it's really like Little Bird or somewhere, I, I feel the energy is going to go on and on. I try to move to the next rather than work so hard. Other people, and also a lot of people want to put a perfect product out. They don't mm -hmm. want anyone to hear it. A lot of producers, I don't mind putting flaws out and changing them because that's the way of life. The polished product is after all the process you have eliminated. I'd rather show some of the flaws because then people realize it's not always a perfect path. It's shaky, the road to creativity. Right. As you know from your show, mm -hmm. it's not always smooth. Well, the evolution of songs is a fascinating thing. Yeah, and I think less pe more people want to show their perfection and aren't willing to show their flaws. I don't mind showing my flaws because from them I learn, as mm -hmm. you know by my typos. <laughs> <laughs> And you have many of them. <laughs> may, I but, may you know, have the world record. It's part of the part of the joy in any of these archival box sets that come out from any artist is hearing how songs develop and take shape over time. And certain words that were attempted at one time are taken out in favor of other words. All that kind of stuff, especially in the arrangements too. I find all of it very interesting. Well, Chivin and I always make a joke. They go, Kalinich Tibbin, Yo Mama, the first 2,000 records. <laughs> I mean, like, it's, we, we write a, a lot, and, and a lot of them are good. Yeah, and, you know, he's, you told me he's extremely prolific, too. Yeah, so he's extremely you're a good prolific. team. Yeah. Yeah. We write different than I do. He's one that will match my words to something he's already written instead of writing it to mine like Brian and them did. So mm. it's a little different process. Okay. Um, just go back to talking about the Beatles just from the perspective of songwriting. I mean, you've mentioned how important something like Within You, Without You is or Let It Be. What is it you look for or what did you notice as the Beatles were growing and developing in the 60s? And even, you know, to, to some degree, whatever you want to talk about with their solo music, what do you look for in, in their music and what did you find most fascinating about studying their music. I like the fact that in addition to the deep heavy stuff that I love that that touches everyone is the light heart, it, the fun part, the romance, close your eyes and I'll kiss. I mean all those songs are so great. Mm -hmm. I mean the little you know like uh, I want to hold your hand. I mean they're basic but uh, I mean just think they're they just grab the consciousness of help I need some they're all like Songs when you're younger, especially, mm. you can, you know, you can relate to them. They they hit, they were on a massive scale of a world consciousness. The world was ripe for something like the Beatles. Yeah, and it's 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 fascinating to study how their music. I don't want to say it always got better and better because I like those early songs too. I don't they all think, have a place. I don't think it got, it became different. Sometimes the initial songs like Little Bird for me, uh, that was maybe one of my best songs. It was my first song because there is a purity about the pure form coming out before you get over critical. Mm -hmm. And you go for the, let the inspiration out because if you touch one person with, where's my pretty bird? He must have flown away. If I keep singing in your own life, all my problems, if I keep singing, maybe they'll work out. Maybe one day I'll get hired again. Maybe I'll find a place. Maybe there'll be a heaven. Mm -hmm. Maybe I won't know. But what I'm saying is they're all the parts 
of failure and success. I think you're right. I think to judge this is the best, that's the best, that's an imperfect judgment, isn't it? Yeah, but the world is full of programs like that, and I'm involved with many of them. And I think that uh, there's plenty of people that find that stuff fascinating, you know? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just saying my viewpoint, but yes. But if, if I pick 10 favorites today, maybe tomorrow I have 10 different favorites. Oh, and I always stress that, that people's opinions can change. Same. It doesn't stay the same for me. Maybe I hear, like a lot of people, like some of the new ones that are out. Like I like some of the Billie Eilish stuff I heard. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you did or not. She's young, but there's something was refreshing about it. Right, right. Hmm. Uh, is there anything from the solo careers of the Beatles that that really impressed you, that you can pinpoint? Um, I liked a lot of the you call the wing solo or not. I consider that something different, but you know, okay. it's to a okay. lot of people, everything post Beatles, that's, that's, that's. Well, you mean like catalog. postcards from the bottom as a McCartney record? Kisses on the bottom. Yeah. That's Kiss, a McCartney yeah. record. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, wings to me, to a lot of people, it's all McCartney, but I see a big difference when you're in yeah, a band. I, I see a big difference. I like some of the George Harrison solo. Mm hmm. Ringo, not as much for me, but there's some good things. Yeah. Some, what, some what's, good. what's impressed you with George? Um, like all things must pass, something like yeah, that? Yeah, all things must pass. Uh, and even though it, it's on Sergeant Pepper, I, I kind of think within you, without you is a George. I look at it as a George, even though it's a Beatles. I don't know if you do or not. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, and some of his views and thoughts when they talk to him about the record. It's just amazing. And then my guitar gently weeps. That's is that a would you consider that a George? As my Yeah, well, it's it's a Beatles recording, but it's a George Harrison song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's so like his individual songs too. I, yeah. I like them. Are there any ones you like that are maybe I'm missing that you really hit you? Oh, God. I mean, I, I like just about everything that George has done in his song. I love career. the concert that he put together from the Bangladesh. I like the all the stuff that he did. I like how he got involved with, uh, I'm not saying I agree with all the religious beliefs, but I like the fact that he uh, engaged and was aware that we're all complicated, but that there was uh, the spiritual side of music and the mm. side of life, and that he, that he gave a platform for the sitar and Ravi Shankar that right. was amazing stuff. To bring that to this element of music is wonderful. How about, isn't it for you? Oh, yeah. But you know, the thing is, as someone who loves everything the Beatles did as a band, really, and almost everything they've done in their solo careers, that's why you need a channel like this or a radio show so you can talk I about love, each I song. I love your show. We could analyze, and I even love some of Ringo's solo stuff, to be honest with you. Uh, he's made so many advances as a songwriter, you know, yeah, he's co-written yeah, yeah. so much. Yes. But, you know, I love the spiritual side of George Harrison very much. And, and in many ways, you know, all four Beatles touch me in, in different ways with their music. And for George to have had that spiritual side at such a young age and to really to really absorb it all lyrically what he says with the songs a lot of his songs are very philosophical a lot of it's spiritual yeah. Yeah. some people it comes across as preachy doesn't bother me at all because he's being honest in his feelings doesn't and I appreciate bother me that. doesn't bother me i also see a lot of that i don't know how you feel about in john lennon mm -hmm. yeah well john's stuff was so highly personal you know um certainly with the plastic Ono band album you can't get more intense and raw and and you know cathartic an album as plastic on all bad but everything else that he did was still very personal too you know a lot of it were you know his feelings and his relationship about yoko yeah. you know but whatever he wrote about was important to him you know yeah. um certainly at the time of that he wrote it but you know all four beatles uh, as i've said before fulfill a, a place in my heart you know, there's no one that can take the place of any of the four of them for what they brought to the world as a group and as solo artists. So, well, I think that they what they brought, the joy that they brought to so many people, the goodness, not the drugs and all this stuff, but mm. th that alone has helped and entertained and brought so many people through a lot of tragedies and stuff like that. I think that's something to remember. 
about the Beatles. And I think the Beach Boys have done a lot of that too. Oh, sure. I mean, that's one of the things that I've noticed so much as I've gotten older. If you ever watch concert footage of artists who have been around for a long time and you see the reactions of people in the audience and many of them are just crying to these songs that have been part of their lives for 30, 40, 50 plus years. That's such a powerful, overwhelming thing. And you yeah. understand that a lot more as you get older. Yes. So um, there's no telling what song can touch a person and, and in such a, an intense way. There, there are certain songs that you connect with for some reason. Maybe other people don't connect on the same level on those songs, yeah. but- even, even another style of music like Paul Williams, when there's no getting over the rainbow, when my smallest of dreams won't come true, I can take all the sadness the world has to give, but I can't last a day without you. That's the most, to me, is such a beautiful lyric. Oh yeah, Paul Williams he's to me is one. He, he's maybe underrated, but he is one of the very wonderful lyrics. He's one of the greats to me. You know, when you can write any song that lasts, you know, all these many years. And Hal David. You know, oh sure. And Burt Bacharach, you know, yeah. they go hand in hand, but yeah, uh, you know, Paul Williams is a hero of mine, as is Burt Bacharach, as is Jimmy Webb, who yeah. I know that he had a big friendship with P.F. Sloan. So, yeah. you know, those are those are among the great songwriters who are not as well known for their own recordings of the songs as they are for writing songs for other people or yeah, songs and, that became and another for other songwriter that I like, but is not as well known was Jesse Barish. Do you know that name? Look it up. No. Sometime. Okay. Yeah. What is he written? Have to introduce me to him. I'm trying to think, but he he has some really nice songs, and I always like him. Yeah. Uh, but Paul Williams is definitely someone that that I greatly admire. And, and he's and, become good friends with me, and he's also a fan of my art, and my paintings. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay, great. You mentioned to me earlier, actually, before we did this recording, that that um, you had met Ed Sullivan. Oh, not, yeah, not only have I met him, I met him in Vegas after my father died. My father used to golf with him. Huh. My father was a golfer, Steve Kay, and he had the Brookline Country Club. He was the head pro in Massachusetts. They had a U.S. Open there and a Riders' Cups. And uh, when I went to the Desert Inn, I was a busboy in the Desert Inn before I signed with the Beach Boys way back. And I told him, I said, I'm Steve Kay's son, Kalinich, you know, and he bought me dinner and he was he was always giving me and he gave me a place to write to him and we kept in touch for a long time that's you know, sweet and real sweet guy and this is you know like this is when all those big stars were getting on and to be friends with him then was a big thing and like now there's a who's Ed Sullivan but because even in a lot of those movies like Bye Bye Birdie I'm going to be on Ed Sullivan you know <laughs> it was like a big it was a big deal but he was such a nice guy and they all were into golf not all of them but a lot of them Mm. Did, so he comment, father, did he comment? Did he comment about your work at all? Did he comment about your your lyrics he, or poetry? No, but you know who did comment was Sonny King, that played with Vito Musso. He was in a couple of movies. He played at the Vegas, the Desert, and with Vito Musso. I don't mm. know if you. Know, these are all musicians and uh, big of Maddox. They all loved my work. Some once in a while they'd have me get up and do a poem. They really loved it. You know, I don't think they ever thought I'd get anything commercial, but. They love the fact that I would do poems and like that. They like that part of me. Hmm. You know, I'm a bus boy and <laughs> being treated like shit, but I was doing some good poems. Hey, you did you did all the odd jobs there, but uh, it all paid off for you in the end. Well, I love it. And I like the fact that I came out of life, even though my family had money, they cut me off. And then my other family had nothing. So they didn't have to cut me off. So there was nothing to cut. <laughs> and so I just kind of worked my way up. Then I met you. I met other people. You know how my life goes. Mm -hmm. And I say what I think, as you know. And I don't always agree with everyone, but I try to say what I think. And if I'm wrong, I try to change. Yeah. That's one of the many things I love about you, you know. I love you, too. And I love <laughs> your family. Okay. So this has been great. And um, I'm going to put a link up for your website or anything else that you want me to share with okay. my viewers. And okay. um, we'll do this again. We'll do part two. Well, where, <laughs> will this, where will this show that we can send them to Facebook or YouTube? This will be on YouTube, but okay, we, can, so, we can share it on Facebook. You can share okay, it. Okay, yeah, let's, 
Let's do the link on YouTube, show me how to share it. And then we'll share it on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, wherever we can share it. Okay, sounds good. And I'll send it to Stuart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or do you send it to him anyway? Hey, maybe it'll help me finally get to interview Paul. <laughs> he has never done it? No, I've That's interviewed Ringo. I I've interviewed Ringo three times, but I've never interviewed Paul. Did you do, were you able to do George? No, no. Uh, at a job that I had for many years in New York City as a producer, um, one of the owners of the company flew out with John Sebastian of the Love and Spoonful to LA when George was promoting, uh, I think it was probably the best of Dark Horse album. And they got George to do an ID for me. Did, which did you, I've used many, did you ever many interview times. John did you ever interview John Sebastian? No, I haven't. I'd love to. Would you, would you like to interview his brother that wrote Summer in the City, Mark, the younger brother? Sure. I'll interview anybody. I'll, Once you I'll, have I'll, a YouTube channel, you can you can do whatever you want. So I, I have a YouTube channel, but I don't. I just put my stuff on like when you do it. But I'm, I, I could originate shows. I just don't have that kind of ambition. But I like to do it when someone else does a show with me and I'll put it up. Um, I will ask him and see if he wants to do it, uh, you know, because he's a good guy. And maybe, you know, I don't know if John's in a space for interviews, but, you know, you never know. Hmm. Okay. Also, well, I don't, he doesn't have a connection with the Beatles, though, but Joe Wizard that produced Boss Gags would be a good interview. Okay. Well, we'll talk about this later. Okay. 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 I love you, buddy. I Thank love you, you too. Are you going to come on after? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just wait a few moments. Thanks to all of you for watching. And um, if you can, please subscribe to my channel. Also subscribe to the Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Um, that's a great podcast strictly on the solo Beatles that I co-host with three other people. And my other Beatles podcast show called Things We Said Today. And if you get a chance, check out uh, my website, kenmichaelsradio.com and there's an earlier interview with stevie beats back to 2004 i think it was that you can find on there as well okay thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time